Welcome to the podcast about investing in startups, where existing investors can learn how to get the best deal possible. And those that have never before invested in startups can learn the keys to success from the venture experts. Your host is Nick Moran, and this is The Full Ratchet. Welcome back to TFR. On this installment of Investor Stories, the experts discuss a startup that failed and the key reasons why. Here's a segment called Postmortems. On today's special segment, we have Bilal Zubiri of Lux Capital. Bilal, can you tell us about a portfolio company that has failed and why you think it failed? So, you know, uh, <laughs> I've several companies that have failed. 10 years of investing will bring that to you. <laughs> I've left scars on my back. But, you know, I've seen a couple of companies that have failed have this common commonality behind them, that they were spun out of academic labs. They had what I considered to be very sort of aggressive, entrepreneurial, academic founders, faculty, professors who were founders. And, and obviously, academia is a hotbed of innovation and amazing things come out of it. So we'll continue to invest in them and continue to look for innovation there. But in, in some of these cases, we failed and we failed early and we failed because we did not, frankly, we were not able to convince the academics to realize that the real task of company building starts after their invention is already completed. And they thought that 90% of the work is already done. Now we just need to hire somebody to sell this thing, not realizing that that's not how it works. So often the companies that failed, you know, a bunch of these academic spin outs, we realized that the faculty members, big egos would not listen to the experience that venture brings, would not bring on a real partner, would try to hire some junior guy to become the BD guy and try to do some business. And that just doesn't work. I think some of our biggest successes have had terrific academic founders, but they are the ones who realize that they need real partners, real teams to take it forward to make a real impact in the real world, and that they would be beneficiaries of it, and they would be real partners along the way as advisors, supporters, chief scientific officers, etc. But they need to bring in the entrepreneurial talent, which does not necessarily reside within the faculty and academia itself. On today's special segment, we have Madhavan Ramanujam. Madhavan, can you tell us about a failed innovation and why it failed? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, probably a long list. I'm just trying to see which one I would pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would probably, I mean, the, the recent innovation failure that was probably in the news, which was kind of fascinating, was the Juicero case where, yep. you know, I mean, there's a product that is supposed to actually help you with like coming up with like the perfect juice. And I don't know if you saw this whole uh, Bloomberg video, which actually showed that, you know, people could make the same juice with just squeezing the packs with their bare hands and they didn't need this machine for $400. I, saw I think it was, it. Like, yep. yeah, it was a classic example of a product that was actually built in isolation of whether people actually needed a product such as that, whether they valued it and it was simply overpriced. I think the list goes on and on. For instance, even Segway, a product that was supposed to change and revolutionized the whole transportation industry, met its first year forecast literally after almost 10 years. And right now, only in uh, visible in shopping malls and, you know, I mean, like probably tourist destinations, it's uh, priced at $5,000. That was not a mode of choice that people actually really wanted to use. So it was a bit of a, the wrong answer to the right question. Productized at a, such a high price point that at the end of the day, did not resonate with anyone. Do you think in the case of Segway that fundamentally the product was not right? Or do you think the product price was just prohibitively too expensive for the mass market to adopt? I think it's a combination, but it's uh, truly understanding like, you know, is there a price point at which a product such as that would actually become relevant, I think would be the key. And sort of, you know, maybe there were different versions, maybe that could have helped. But I think it was for moving from point A to point B for $5,000. That just didn't make sense. On today's special segment, we have Tim O'Reilly. Tim, can you tell us a story about a portfolio company that's failed and why it failed? Well, one interesting recently was uh, Skyliner HQ. Uh, and the reason they failed was exactly that reason I talked about earlier, being too close to the center of the bullseye. They developed uh, some interesting new features for AWS, and they were getting a lot of customer uptake. And then Amazon said, oh, very nice. We're going to have to have that feature. And then the company was relegated to becoming an acquirer. 
how do you defend against that? I mean, is it? You don't. You don't. I mean, I think that's one of the real risks. You have to be very careful when, you know, particularly in this stage of the market, you have to be careful when you're playing around the big guys. In fact, I mean, I'm still kind of a sucker. I w- I've been talking with uh, Bryce about another company that I would like to invest in. And he's like, what's going to you know, keep this from going the way of Skyliner? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great piece of technology. The people who are using it, including us, love it. It's really powerful, but it's dancing very close to the feet of an elephant. I worry about that with my own portfolio. Not with every tech no. company, but particularly with Amazon. It feels it almost feels like if they want to do something, they they can just build it. Well, the thing that's sort of rough there is is I think that if they really want to preserve their the ecosystem that's helping make them successful, when they're doing that build by decision, the short term might be well, we can build that pretty easily. Why would we pay for it? The long term consequence of that though is that literally the investment in new ideas is going to go somewhere else. I always think of Microsoft Bob as an example of what happens when the innovation no longer comes from outside and you know because you basically killed off all the opportunity you know and so you're kind of like well you know we're so smart we'll come up with interesting things remember clippy the you know the, sure. <laughs> the talking paper clip uh, <laughs> that's right like, come on. It was like, it was total crap stuff that was coming out of Microsoft because there were no new ideas coming out of their ecosystem anymore because they'd killed off the ecosystem. And meanwhile, all the developers and entrepreneurs had gone over to this new area of the internet where there was no you know, obvious money to be made, but at least you could do cool stuff. I think basically the long-term play is make sure that if somebody invents something that you reward them for it. Don't kill them for it. Yeah, when you talk about the alpha geeks, as you mentioned before, are you talking about these ecosystems and these communities of sort of new original thinkers that are emerging, whether it be the open source movement or the maker movement or otherwise, and getting in bed, taking embedded with them and taking a fresh eyes look at what they're doing and seeing where the opportunities are at? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, right now, I think some of the interesting things I see... You know, certainly in biotech, there's a huge amount that's happening. This new field that some people are calling neurotech, you know, basically, you know, understanding how the brain works and not neuroscience, but neurotech, how are we actually, you know, doing things, you know, companies like Control Labs, which is basically, you know, creating brain machine interfaces, you know, for computers using muscle signals or what Brian Johnson is doing with Kernel much more aggressively, you know, what, what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink. That's all fascinating alpha geekish stuff and of course i think space is another one of those uh, and transportation in general another one of those alpha geek areas right now love it and, and there's also just stuff my son-in-law is an engineer saul griffith uh, has a company called other lab which is kind of a really interesting story also for entrepreneurs who are looking for alternate ways to build a business now it's actually a little more challenging right now in the current political climate but where you know where they're trying to cut budgets but you know Saul basically has built companies using funding from National Science Foundation DARPA you know he basically develops deep technology you know and mostly in energy related areas and then once it's developed they spin it up into an operating company then they go out for money so they're getting all this non-dilutive money to do fundamental research. So they, you know, and things like they've got one company called Sunfolding, which is, you know, how to use pneumatics to control solar arrays, you know, industrial solar arrays. They've got another one called Volute, which is, you know, how to use microtubules to make natural gas tanks that can fit any arbitrary shape uh, rather than being big cylinders. You know, it's just crazy stuff that they got some stuff in air conditioning and you know, some robotics for, uh, you know, in construction. They have soft robots. There's all these really interesting fundamental technology areas that really require hard research. They're not, you know, wow, I have an idea and I can code it up in, you know, a couple of weeks and get to my minimum viable product. It may be, no, we're, we're building, you know, we have some fundamental physics problems to solve here first. And this idea of actually getting R&D money, you know, and actually building an independent R&D lab I think it's been a really interesting. There have been a couple of them over the years. You know, uh, Danny Hillis and crew had one, but Saul's done a great job of that. Otherlab.com if you want to learn more about it. Check it out. (laughs) 
That will conclude this installment of Investor Stories. If you're enjoying the program and would like to see it continue, take a moment and leave a five-star review in iTunes. Also, if you'd like updates on new content from TFR, as well as the top 10 VC articles every week, go to fullratchet.net and sign up for the newsletter. Okay, that will wrap things up for today. Until next time, over-prepare, choose carefully, and invest confidently. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.